Hello, this is Professor James Strickler. Welcome to this course on American government. This lesson is from Unit 2, Constitutional History, and it's Lesson 9, About the Constitution. In this lesson, you'll learn about James Madison's Virginia Plan, about the actual creation of the United States Constitution, about the Great Compromise that made the Constitution possible, the Three-Fifths Compromise, that was important to its success, and the slavery importation compromise also. Now, the Constitution was a result of the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. At that convention, 12 states attended to discuss amending the Articles of Confederation, as was discussed in the previous lesson. The delegates that attended that convention to discuss amending the Articles of Confederation did so on the premise that the Articles of Confederation were far too weak to deal with the problems that the states needed to collectively address. Problems about trade and commerce, and also about defense against potential foreign invasion, things like that. So they knew the Articles of Confederation were far too weak, but within that very short time period preceding this, they had fought a war to get independence from Great Britain. And that was fresh in their memories also, that they had actually shed blood to escape a government that they considered to be too strong. So this left the delegates with a difficult problem. Try to create a government that is strong enough to actually successfully deal with the problems it face, faces but yet not so strong that it becomes oppressive to the people that it's supposed to be serving. The problem is further complicated by the fact that uh, the states wanted to remain independent, while at the same time they wanted to find a way to cooperate closely together. Now those two desires are in tension with each other. Close cooperation is best uh, accomplished by unifying the, the participants, while independence oftentimes leads to disagreement and inefficiency. So the delegates, of the delegates of the convention also had to deal with this, trying to leave the states with a sufficient feeling of independence while providing a uh, government, a national uniting government with enough power to get the states to cooperate as they should. And at the same time, create a government that wasn't too weak to get everything done that it was supposed to, but also not so strong that it could become oppressive. Now, as was mentioned in the previous lesson, they realized that they couldn't accomplish these purposes under the Articles of Confederation. So the convention agreed to amend the Articles of Confederation out of existence. Now, the reason it had to be done that way is because the delegates that were sent to the convention in Philadelphia were only empowered by their state legislatures to, set, to suggest amendments to the Articles of Confederation. So they had to look at that amendment power as a, a way to get rid of the other entire articles and replace them by simply saying, we are amending the entire thing at once and replacing it with something else. Now, the path they followed to accomplishing this was laid out before them by James Madison. Other people had not thought this through beforehand. They had not realized, as James Madison did, that the Articles of Confederation could not be saved. Because Madison realized this beforehand, he spent months in study trying to figure out the best way to create a new system of government to bind the 13 states together. Because he was Virginia, from Virginia, the plan that he came up with became known as the Virginia Plan. And James Madison became known as the father of the Constitution. When you show up at a meeting where people want to get things done and nobody has a plan when they go into the meeting except one person, that one person in a plan with a plan is likely to then dominate the meeting. And that one person's plan is likely to be the plan that the meeting comes up with. And that's how it worked out for James Madison. He was the only person to show up with a plan and so his plan became the outline for what eventually became the United States Constitution. It served as the agenda that the meeting followed, taking his plan apart piece by piece.
to see what worked best and what didn't and what they might change. But to a great extent, it, found, it provided an outline for the new government that they'd end up creating. And that's exactly what they did. They created an entirely new government rather than simply amending the old one. Now remember the old one was a uh, confederation, a way to help the 13 independent little countries loosely cooperate together. Well, the United States Constitution that they ended up drafting at this convention provided a much fuller and stronger central government to unite the, the 13 states together to the point that it actually transformed the nature of those states. No longer were they 13 separate little countries, but they became units in a single country under the United States Constitution. Now, at this point, it was simply going to be a proposal from the delegates of this convention. In a later lesson, I'll talk about how it actually ended up being accepted by the states and binding them together as a single country. But for right now, just understand that that's the, the change that the Constitution was setting up to happen in the form that it took at the convention. Now, to get to that point, though, of them proposing an entirely new government, they had to get around some significant conflicts at the convention, and they had to enter into some very important compromises. And the rest of this lesson is going to be talking about what those major compromises were at the Constitutional Convention. The first issue that had to be dealt with was one of representation. You see in this quote from John Locke that he talks about that uh, when we form a government and it starts doing things for us, that it must be by our own consent. And that consent is expressed through the majority, either by themselves or through their representatives. This is a basic foundational idea of the kind of government that was being created in the United, what would be the United States of America. It's an idea that we've talked about previously in this course as popular sovereignty that the people are in charge. And John Locke explained, as we've seen in a previous lesson, that in order for the government to do anything, it really has to have the consent of the people given through their representatives. This is why, in the lead up to the American Revolution, they talked about no taxation without representation. So they knew at the Philadelphia Convention that whatever government they created would have to be representative. It would have to have some sort of people there meeting in the government who had been chosen by the masses of people that represented the real power in the 13 states. But they weren't sure exactly how that, what structure that representation would, would, uh, would have. On one side were people like James Madison, who came from large states. Now what I mean by large states is states with big populations like Virginia, and they believed that representation in this new government they were creating should be based entirely on population. In other words, a state with more people should get more representatives. While people who were at the convention representing small states, in other words, states with fewer people, were worried about that. They were, worried that they were concerned that big states like Virginia or New York would end up bossing small states like New Jersey or Delaware around. And so they were greatly concerned with this idea of doing representation entirely based on population. And they were unwilling to agree to doing it that way. Instead, they wanted each state represented equally in the government. So maybe every state gets five representatives, or every state gets eight representatives, whatever it is. It just, in their opinion, it should be equal so that the small states would have as much power as the big states and not be bullied around by them. Well, this dispute over representation went so deep that it was continually set aside at the convention because they couldn't figure out what to do about it. That was until a man named Roger Sherman, late in the convention when it looked like this dispute might end the, all their work that they'd been uh, struggling with all summer and that would end up in failure. Roger Sherman at that point suggested what became known as the Great Compromise, or the Connecticut Compromise, because it was suggested by him, a delegate from Connecticut. Essentially, what the Great Compromise does is it says that they're going to have a bicameral legislature, in other words, a legislature with two houses, and in one, the House of Representatives, the representation would be based on population, so a big state like Virginia would get more seats in the House of Representatives, and a small state with little population would get fewer seats. 
And then in the other house of this bicameral legislature, the United States Senate, every state would be represented equally, as it turned out, by two senators. So this is a way to give both sides a bit of what they wanted, rather than uh, deciding on one in favor of the other. And this great compromise was narrowly accepted and saved the convention. So then that provides our first major compromise of the convention, the great compromise that produced our bicameral legislature. The next big compromise at the convention came, once you've decided you're going to have representation, um, how do you count who's going to be represented? That was the issue then. And you, you may wonder, well, wait a minute, how is that an issue? It shouldn't it just be every citizen or whatever? Well, the issue was about slavery. Southern states wanted to count their slaves as part of their population. So they would look like they have more people, and therefore they would get more representatives. Northern states thought this was a horrible idea. If the southern states were going to treat their slaves as property, then they should be counted as property rather than people and determining how many people were in the state and thus how many representatives they would get in the House of Representatives. Well, the way this uh, conflict was resolved was through a negotiation. One side wanted the slaves to count as zero. The other wanted them to count as, entire, as uh, people, just like the white people in the population. And they negotiated back and forth and eventually settled on a number of three-fifths. Now, as a practical matter, what that means is that for every five slaves in the population, that number would be counted as though it was three white people for totaling up the number of people in the state. Now, some people look at a slavery compromise like this and think that it taints the entire United States Constitution. In a way, it does, because it acknowledges uh, the legitimate existence of a practice from within our, that in our modern morality we consider to be evil and wrong. But as we look back in history, we have to realize the reality of the time. And that was that if this compromise had not been entered into, then the southern states would have never agreed to the Constitution. And the United States, at least as we know it today, would never have come into existence. This was one of the prices paid for union at the time. So that gives us our second major compromise of the Constitutional Convention, the Three-Fifths Compromise, which decided how slaves would be counted for purposes of representation. The last great compromise also dealt with slavery, specifically the international slave trade the importation of slaves from Africa to the United States. And this was an issue because, remember, from the previous lesson that we had about the things leading up to the, con to the convention in Philadelphia, that issues of trade and uh, commerce were the big concern. So one of the powers that was quickly agreed to at the convention was that this new government they were creating would have power to regulate commerce, in other words, trade, buying and selling, among other places, with foreign nations. And so pro-slavery people were worried once this power would be given to a national government, the national government would use that power to then outlaw the slave trade, make it illegal for slaveholders in the United States to bring in additional slaves from outside the country. So with that fear in mind, they settled on a compromise. And the compromise also found in the Constitution says that the importation of people, even for slavery, wouldn't be prohibited by this new national government that they're creating until a uh, period 20 years from when the Constitution was being written. And in fact, once the Constitution was accepted and the 20 years had passed, Congress did in fact outlaw the slave trade with other countries. Now, it didn't mean slavery was outlawed. It just meant you couldn't go get additional slaves from outside the United States. And the southern states were willing to agree that, to this if they were given 20 years first to get ready to build up their own domestic population of slaves. This gives us the last of the major compromises, the Constitutional Convention, uh, the Slavery Importation Compromise. So now let's review what we learned in this lesson. First, what was the Virginia plan? Was it a political party agenda? Was it a treaty organization? Was it a revolutionary war strategy? Or was it a constitutional outline? The 
correct answer is that it was a constitutional outline. It was James Madison's plan for a new constitutional government. And it ended up providing the basis for the government that we have in the United States of America today. Next question. How did the Constitution change the states? Did it strengthen their borders? Did it make them all one country? Did it eliminate their governors? Or did it increase their debt? Correct answer is that it made them all one country. A dramatic change. This is a big thing for them to eventually accept. What did the Great Compromise solve? Was it the problem of dividing up power among the branches of government? Was it a problem about who would tax imports? Was it a problem of representation in Congress? Or was it a problem of who would have veto power? Well, the Great Compromise was about representation in Congress. And the solution was a House based on population and a Senate where every state was represented equally. What did the three comp three-fifths compromise solve? Was it counting of people for representation? Was it the approval of treaties? Was it the election of the president? Or was it the setting of tax rates? It was about the counting of people for representation, specifically the counting of slaves, with every five slaves counting as three white people. And why was the slavery importation compromise needed? Was it because of the regulation of commerce? the Emancipation Proclamation, the dwindling of slave populations, or because of international treaties. Now, if you remember carefully what you just learned in this lesson, you'll know that it was about the regulation of commerce. It was a belief that turned out to be true that once given the chance, Congress had outlaw commerce, uh, the type of commerce that involved uh, bringing in slaves from outside the country. And so they had to figure out a way to compromise to make sure that the southern states didn't feel oppressed by that and were willing to join the Constitution. All right, that does it for this lesson. This is a little longer one. We had a lot to get through. The next lesson will be shorter, I promise. Um, the next lesson will be from Unit 2, uh, Lesson 10, about limiting the powers of this new government.